Hi everyone, this is Ted Bauman, editor of The Bauman Letter here at uh, Banyan Hill Publishing. Now, as you know, I've been running a series on competition in the US economy, uh, or rather the lack of it. And this week, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, healthcare and how lack of competition in the healthcare sector uh, imposes probably one of the biggest costs on Americans that comes from industrial uh, and economic uh, consolidation and lack of competition in the economy. Now, uh, last week I showed you that uh, healthcare in the United States is much more expensive than any other uh, comparable country, and we get worse outcomes uh, in terms of life expectancy, years lost to disease, and so on. Today I'm going to talk a bit about the reasons for that, but first I want to dispel a myth that is very common when people talk about healthcare in the United States. We do not have a free market in healthcare in the United States. In fact, the healthcare market in the United States is less free, in other words, it's less uh, of a competitive market than in countries like France or Switzerland that also have a mixture of public and private healthcare. In fact, the United States healthcare system is kind of like the worst of both worlds. Here's why. Well, first of all, the United States provides publicly funded healthcare for the two most expensive and vulnerable uh, population groups in the country. We give uh, Medicare to the elderly and Medicaid to the very poor. Uh, on top of that, we have a uh, healthcare system for military veterans uh, called TRICARE that honestly is about as close to single-payer socialist medicine that you can possibly get. So what that means is that the part of the healthcare system that the government is providing is actually targeted on the most expensive and most difficult groups uh, to treat and the most uh, you know, expensive groups to treat. Now, the second big issue and the second reason why we cannot talk about a uh, free market in healthcare in the United States is that the fact that we have employer-provided healthcare and that it is not considered part of taxable income imposes a huge uh, subsidy, right? Uh, in terms of the healthcare system. It removes critical information from the system that makes it almost impossible for the ordinary person to be able to tell what healthcare actually costs. Now, I'm gonna talk a lot about that today, but first I wanna talk about a fascinating statistic I found the other day. Going back to 1970, the actual uh, take-home pay of the median US uh, worker has actually stagnated, it's actually dropped uh, by a few percentage points. In other words, the amount of money in inflation-adjusted terms that each of us takes home as a paycheck every month has not really changed much since 1970. However, the cost of employment of uh, workers in the United States, in other words, the cost that employers actually pay out on behalf of their workers has risen dramatically, almost 60%. So that means that employers are spending more on us, but it's not going to us. Where's it going? it's going to health insurance payments. Essentially, what's happened is that all of the increase in money spent on workers in the United States since about 1970 has gone to increased health insurance payments, which of course then goes on to the health uh, sector itself. So the big question is, how do we know this? I mean, how, how, do, how do the people get a, a, a handle on this? Well. I don't know what my employer pays on my behalf for health, uh, health insurance premiums. I know what I pay. I don't know what my employer pays. And that's tr true of almost every worker in the United States. So essentially what we have is a system where the most important part of the healthcare market is completely closed off in terms of what we're actually paying for it, what our employers are paying for it, and how that actually affects us in our pockets. And this is an important point, I think, particularly going into a presidential election cycle where a lot of people are talking about health care. Remember um, that the additional cost of something, let's say, like uh, uh, Medicare for all um, would be a, an additional uh, cost paid out. But if we were to remove the uh, health insurance payments that employers are currently paying, that would be more money in our pockets. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the background that we're not aware of. Now, let's, let's look at what some of these are. Now, why have insurance premiums in the United States uh, skyrocketed since 1970? Well, the major reason is the increase in the cost of healthcare itself. And as I showed you in my last video, the main driver of that cost comes from the private sector. It's not the U.S. government's uh, healthcare programs. Uh, in fact, even though they focus on the most vulnerable 
uh, uh, populations, the, the elderly, the poor, etc., uh, our public health care costs have remained fairly stable, uh, and they're more or less in line with other countries. The private sector is very different. Now, one thing that a lot of people complain about is the cost of uh, drugs. Well, the reality is that the, the increase in the cost of medications in the United States has actually slowed down a lot, uh, particularly over the last five years or so. Uh, it's basically lower than the overall inflation rate. What hasn't slowed down is the cost of hospitals and physician services. And this is where the big cost driver in the United States uh, healthcare system is. Uh, the, the cost of hospital care in the United States um, and increasingly the cost of physician care is increasing at a rate of about 5 to 6% per year, whereas our overall inflation rate is only about 2%. So as you can see, uh, there's a big gap opening up between the cost of health care uh, and the cost of everything else in the economy, including prescription drugs. Now, the question is, why would this be the case? Well, uh, one of the things that makes it uh, possible for uh, those prices to rise so much is that the actual cost of healthcare, the, the things that are charged by hospitals and physician groups, is not transparent. Uh, the Trump administration is currently fighting a battle, in fact, with the uh, med medical industry to try to get uh, hospitals to publish accurate, or accurate price lists of their uh, procedures and everything that, that, they, that they provide. They refuse to do it. The hospitals won't do it. The way it works right now is that when you go to a hospital and you have an insurance plan paid for by your employer, the hospital and that insurer have, will have negotiated a set of prices for the procedures that you're going to get, for the various things that you're going to consume while you're there. The problem is that it depends entirely on A, uh, whether your insurance, uh, insurance company is big enough to have enough um, bargaining power to get the hospital to uh, 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 lower its prices, or also how, uh, how much that hospital has monopoly power in the local market. Now, let's just look at a couple of, of procedures and, and show you why uh, this is the case. Um, you can get a mammogram um, in Philadelphia uh, that will either cost you $150 or $550, depending on your insurer and the hospital that you go to. Same procedure, no difference in outcome, but a $400 difference in price just because the relationship between insurers and hospitals makes it uh, untransparent, right? So if you happen to live in a place where hospitals uh, have a lot of monopoly power, then that means they can charge your insurance company, the, the one that your employer has arranged for you, much higher prices that in turn translates into higher insurance premiums that your insurer pays out on your behalf, which cuts into your potential wage growth, right? Now, uh, a scan of your lower back. I found a figure the other day that says in Louisiana, you can get a scan of your lower back uh, for $150. But the same procedure, the exact same procedure, $7,500 in Southern California. Now, that shows a market that has no uh, competitive pressures at all. This is what happens when people don't have access to information. One of the things that has driven this process, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is the fact that employers, when they buy insurance on our behalf, uh, are essentially taking that whole uh, set of information, all those decisions, away from you and me, and they're basically relocating them between the insurance companies and the hospitals. So two big sets of consolidated uh, industries, the insurers on the one hand, the hospitals on the other, are making decisions about uh, what we pay for services and we're not even allowed to see them. Now, one of the things that is driving this process is just a wave of mergers in the hospital industry. There have been more than 680 mergers between different hospital groups since 2010. Many regions of the country, many cities are dominated by just one or two big hospital groups. Here in Atlanta, where I live, uh, Emory University and the uh, medical system that goes with it is essentially the hospital system for this entire area. Now, fortunately, we do have a couple of others in Atlanta, and Emory is a reasonably good uh, corporate citizen when it comes to not overcharging. But there are many cities in the United States where that's not the case. And especially in rural areas, you often find situations where only one big hospital or one big um, group of hospitals is available and they can charge whatever they want because they don't have any competition. Now, the hospital groups weren't satisfied with just getting into uh, things like um, 
you know, hospital consolidation. They've also started buying physicians' practices and putting them together into physicians' groups. And essentially, they operate the same way as the hospitals. The more physicians that work for a given physician group, the less competition there is and the less transparency there is in terms of pricing. So the first big message today for me is that the uh, increase in competition, or the decrease in competition rather, in the medical care industry is being obscured by the mechanism, the insurance mechanism, employer paid healthcare uh, insurance, and it has allowed hospitals to get away with absolutely insane pricing. We never see it. It's not like you're going to buy a car. You go into the hospital, you have no idea what they're gonna charge you and they won't tell you up front. Now, I wanna uh, review a couple of different ways that this really comes down to almost fraud. In fact, I came across an article the other day called Where All the Frauds Are Legal. Uh, and it was by a woman whose husband had been in a bicycle accident. And she talked about several ways in which what happens in the medical system is in fact fraudulent. The first one she talks about is surprise billing. Now that happens when you go to a hospital uh, and it turns out that you are treated in part of uh, the care uh, services that you get by someone who may not be in your insurer's network. And as a result, that person, if it's a doctor uh, or maybe even a, a blood analyst or radiologist or whatever, you might get a bill that your insurance is not going to cover. Now, what we found out is that uh, it, it, over the last 10 years or so, almost 20% of inpatient admissions to hospitals in the United States uh, lead to um, uh, surprise billing, right? So essentially what happens is that when you walk into a hospital, whether it's an emergency or not an emergency, they don't tell you up front whether or not you might be charged more because the care pr providers are outside your insurance network. So imagine if you did that in any other business. You walk into a store and they don't tell you what the prices are for the goods. You get to the checkout counter and you suddenly see this massive price. Well, that's what happens. Now, the second thing is what she called, uh, the author of this article called medical swag. I found this one fascinating. Uh, her husband uh, in a bicycle accident uh, was given a neck brace to stabilize his spine uh, for uh, about 30 minutes when he first came into the hospital because they didn't know if his neck was broken, right? Now, she never saw that uh, uh, neck brace again. It was taken off, right? They charged the family $319 for it, right? Now, theoretically, it was supposed to go home with them, but somebody decided to put it on. It was probably reused, but they still charged them $319. So essentially, uh, anytime you go into a hospital, there the hospital has every incentive to use things on you, even if they don't use them for very long, even if they're unnecessary, and charge you the full price for the goods that you never see again, right? Now, essentially, that is called medical swag. And what this woman says is that in her experience and in her investigations, it's proved to be a massive, massive driver of costs. Now, here's one that really shocks me. And this is what she calls the cover charge. Um, when her husband went to the emergency room <clears throat> after his bicycle accident, the biggest single charge on his bill was what was called a trauma activation fee. It was over $7,000. Now, a trauma activation fee is essentially a cover charge that emergency rooms charge patients just for being there. It's not part of the uh, actual treatment of the patients. It's simply a charge that is meant to contribute to the ongoing uh, existence of emergency rooms. It was put in place after 9-11 as uh, the result of the hospital industry arguing to Congress that they needed to be able to charge a basic fee that would help to cover all the uh, costs of maintaining emergency rooms. Now, they make far more money than they need to, to um, run emergency rooms, but they're still charging these cover charges. You can still uh, pay uh, $5,000 or more, or your insurance company can, just to have the emergency room exist. Now, again, this is something that is not subject to market forces at all. Hospitals just make up whatever they want to charge. Sometimes they can be as low as $1,000. Uh, other times they can be as high as eight or $9,000. The bottom line is that this is yet again an instance where the fact that we are not allowed to see the pricing that's going on, not allowed to, to uh, sh make comparison shopping, they just take advantage of that to charge us a lot of money. Now, here's another one, imposter billing. 
Uh, one of the things that you'll often notice when, uh, if you're in a hospital, is that you may have someone come in and just run a little test on you, uh, or you know maybe somebody comes and, and uh, uh, you know adjusts a neck brace or uh, maybe um, changes a splint on a broken finger or something. Now, oftentimes these people are uh, representing doctors who um, are formally supervising them. So, for example, you can have uh, what they call extenders. You can have nurse practitioners who come and give you services on the behalf of the doctor. You never see the doctor, but the doctor charges you full price as though he or she, with all the expertise and all the education and all the skills that they're supposed to have, were actually present at your bedside. Sometimes a single doctor can be theoretically treating four or five uh, different people at one time and collecting fees from each one of them. So essentially what you have here is a system where uh, the uh, medical professionals who control the system charge whatever fee they uh, are able to get away with, even if they're not the ones providing the service. So again, if that were to happen in any other industry, we would not put up with that. But we have to do it in this case because the insurance companies uh, are basically paying these things out on our behalf or on behalf of our employers, and we're not involved. Now, uh, another one, and this is something that I saw in the case of my uh, stepfather who passed away a while back, uh, was that uh, after a procedure, sometimes the uh, hospital will decide that, it, uh, that, that they require that you be visited by a physical therapist or somebody uh, else to provide follow-up care at home. Now, um, what this woman talked about in her article was that many times the people who come, uh, you know, you may not be home. Uh, they may not even call before they come. They just show up. They may leave a note or a message on the phone saying we were here. Well, every time they do that, they bill your insurance company, right? Whether you get the treatment or not, they keep uh, coming and there's nothing to stop them from doing so because uh, technically speaking, the hospital is making this decision on your behalf. She calls this drive-by billing, where basically you are getting, uh, you're required to pay for services that you don't ask for, that you may not need. Uh, and even if they're not provided, they still charge you for them. Uh, lastly, there are things like uh, what she calls the enforced upgrade. Now, uh, this is, for example, um, a case where somebody, uh, in her case, her husband's case, he had a broken finger as a result of his mice, uh, bicycle accident. And what happened was that they put a plastic splint on this woman's husband's finger, um, and he uh, found that it was uh, putting pressure on the, uh, the brake and causing him pain. So uh, he went back to the emergency room uh, and they adjusted the, uh, the splint. They, 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 they cut a little bit of plastic off it to, to adjust it. He was charged $481 for surgery, right? Classified as surgery and billed as 20 minutes of active surgery time just to have a nurse clip off a piece of plastic from uh, a finger splint. Now, so essentially this is the kind of stuff uh, that is driving up the cost of medical care. It's inconceivable that any of us would accept these kind of outrageous charges uh, and practices in any other industry. And the reason why uh, they happen is because the insurance companies have no incentive to do it any differently. As long as employers are paying the premiums, it's not in the insurance company's industry to quibble over a finger splint or a surgical charge of uh, almost $500 that is, could be done for, you know, three cents if, if you just pick up a pair of scissors and do it. So essentially what's happening is that it's the employer-based system and the opacity that it uh, imposes on the entire medical cost structure combined with the um, consolidation of hospital groups and physician groups that is preventing us from getting costs under control. Again, to go back to what I said at the beginning of the video, this is not a free market. This is a market that is heavily, heavily rigged. And it's rigged because we can't see what's going on. Uh, the entire insurance system, the private insurance system through employers, the thing that people are so fighting not to uh, give up, people are saying, we don't want Medicare for all because we want to keep our insurers. That's the thing that raises the prices. That's the thing that's making this whole system work. So uh, I think the critical thing to understand in conclusion is that when we talk about uh, healthcare prices, 
we sometimes are, are left with the impression that this is something that is driven by over usage. You know, we want to discourage people from spending too much time in emergency rooms. Uh, we don't want them to go and see their doctors. We want the home health care. We, we want wellness programs that make us better so you don't use insurance. Well, just fixing this insane pricing, cutting down on the administrative costs that I showed you last week, you know, the, the 10 or 15 or 20 percent of the cost of a hospital stay that just goes in, into paperwork. All of that stuff could dramatically decrease medical costs in the United States. It would therefore have a downward pressure on insurance rates, which would potentially free up more of our employers' money to be paid to us so we could spend it on the things that we want. But as long as this system remains as it is right now, uh, essentially uh, deliberately uh, difficult to understand, prices that are never published, pricing procedures that are controlled by the supplier with no participation, no choice by the consumer, the patient, this is going to carry on. So this is Ted Bauman speaking. And uh, again, I'm uh, basically running this series of video because I want people to understand that in your quest to try to preserve your wealth, particularly if you're getting older, um, earning money through things like my Bauman letter. And by the way, if you're interested, you can see a sign up link down at the bottom uh, of the text under this video. But the other thing besides making money in, in the stock market and investing is trying to save money. And when you realize that so much of the money that goes out of your pocket is going out because of things that I regard as fraud, I regard them almost as, as criminal, but they happen in this country simply because the people uh, who benefit from them have the ears of the politicians, they pay the lobbyists, they make political contributions. And as long as that continues, we are going to continue to have this problem. So this is Ted Bauman signing off. Uh, I'll be back to you next week with a discussion of another industry that is also subject to massive overpricing and underperformance, and that is telecommunications. I'll talk to you again soon. Take care.